It's Agropolis. Agropolis. Yes. Yep. There's a like a, a terrible naming tragedy. My best friend is a guy named Jimmy Brecken, mm. and he's from Fargo or rural Fargo, where I grew up. Where I grew up in a farm in North mm-hmm. Dakota. His mother's name, maiden name, was um, Anastasia Constantine Jamaica. It's just this beautiful, wow, that's a great name. beautiful, like his yeah, yeah. T- twenty dollar Greek name, mm-hmm. and she <laughs> and she married Harvey Brecken, which is the worst Norwegian name ever. And so for the rest of her life, she was Anna Brecken and not Anastasia Constantine Jamaica. Not to give up. It was, yeah, to marry in a region. <laughs> Should we go? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, all right, cool. All right, um, hey, welcome to Design Smoke, um, our second installment. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're very proud to be here today with Dimitri Agropolis, who is a window dresser of some renown in New York City, where we are on this beautiful summer evening, um, at Bergdorf which is one of the most amazing stores that has ever existed. Um, and we're here to talk a little bit about the trade of window dressing. Sure, sure. And more specifically, just about your story. So um, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Demetrius, would you just introduce yourself and tell you where you come from and uh, what you do? My name is Demetrius, and I'm originally from Michigan, and I'm a window dresser. I, uh, gee, I went to art school, and I couldn't figure out what to major in, what to do, so I did everything. And then uh, I ended up window dressing because you get to still do everything. <laughs> right on. To declare. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where'd you go to school? Uh, I was at the U of M and I started in the residential college, which is kind of the hippie college there. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up in the art school, despite my parents' better thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. But, um, they do have thoughts. But, uh, they, that, do, they, yeah. they both went and said, well, if you really want to. But um, they warned against. But, um, it's worked out well. Worked out my well. parents had some yeah. interesting warning against me. I, I considered being an attorney, and my father uh-huh. was so such an anathema to be an attorney. <laughs> but actually, actually, studying art was a real positive. Uh, wow. Yeah, yeah it really. Okay. Never stood in the way of me studying art uh-huh. because I just did, would have hated me as an attorney. <laughs> um, so you work at Bergdorf right now. Can you yeah. explain just what you do as a window dresser? Because I certainly know the trade, but yeah. it, it is it is an incredibly revered part of the design world from my perspective. Yeah. Because some of my design heroes, like Sarah Nelson in Minneapolis, and I believe Louise Philly, who's a huge influence on me, uh, has incredible reverence for window dressing. Uh, and and as, as we talked a little bit earlier today, uh, um, the value of that street level of communication is just kind of going through the roof right now and being rediscovered. Um, maybe because of the fall of influence from commercial advertising. Um, because there are so many ways of avoiding commercial advertising now that street level communication like window dressing is incredibly important and now has a new value. Um, so if you could just describe what you do or just what a day is like. Well, we, you know, we have uh, a lot of, we've got windows on all three sides of the store. So it's a constant rotation. We aim for a, about a two week change out. So there's wow. always, wow. you're working on one, you're planning the next one, and then you're down the line planning the third one. And it's a lot of, you know, you have to come up with the ideas, you have to plan it out a little bit, source everything. I'm, I'm kind of the main sourcing guy right there. What happens right from now? sourcing? So because, I mean, you have to find all the materials yeah, if you're you going to make, find it. if you're going to build an you know, alien. Sometimes you're... you've got months and sometimes you've got hours. You know, you just, it depends on when the thought hits. So, <laughs> um, so I'm getting pretty good at being resourceful like that and I was uh, where do you find stuff actually where, where do you locate oh stuff? all over the place I don't know what we did before eBay to be honest that's, <laughs> uh, that's been a huge help but um, it's you know it's all over I go to the flea market and uh, you know we if, if we're flush we'll look on first dibs and if we're uh, you know scrounging we'll see what you can get for the dollar store and you know it's it's a lot of uh, it's from all over the place but um it's, it's kind of funny, I was, I've kind of always assumed that window dressing was the only, like, the most disorganized of, of any of these fields, and... I doubt that. <laughs> lately, I'm, I'm finding out that um, I've, I met someone who does work in film, and they were, they were here filming uh, a, kind of a big movie, and they, were, they called us, and they were like, oh my god, we're in town, we don't know where to find mannequins, we need to find this or that we need to like a six foot snail what do we do and like, okay i can help you i can get you this so it was kind of but i was surprised that they hadn't you know 
planned this out months in advance or had artists there doing it. They had many artists working, but it was... Um, it, it actually just might be your comfort level like, because the one window dresser uh, that I know, uh, um, uh, just master improv artist uh, and very comfortable doing improv artist. Yeah. Um, and the film world, I think, is a little bit like a gypsy wagon mm. and you spend a lot of your time living like a gypsy. Whereas if you're living in a town doing window dressing, you'd have a little more resources. It's true. Yeah, yeah. You get to know the place, and know, sure. know all the services. So what's yeah. what's the, the, just the square footage, I mean, the, just the actual area that you have to yeah, t- master? Well, the, the windows themselves are not huge. Bergdorf's is nice because we have 12-foot tall windows on Fifth Avenue. So it's uh, five really grand windows to work with, which is a little unheard of. It's kind of, it's, it's pretty swanky. And... Uh, it's unheard of and, now. Uh, I, I, I do predict that there will be this renaissance. There in, could be. There could be. It's, um, you know, it works in big cities. It works in where you've got street traffic and people on the sidewalk and, you know, uh, enough activity. I think the, you know, through the middle, I think the malls help rub it out big time. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, it used to be a real, like a, a a very noble trait. There's, I, I am into historical research on window dressing, and there's, uh, at the turn of the century, it was huge. People sure. were showmen and window men, and, and there was sign writers and um, prop makers and crepe paper flower makers, and you know, it was a whole industry. That's interesting. And it's dwindled. It's not. It's it's kind of a between profession now. I think. Yeah, that's an interesting historical perspective because um, I do some work with landscape architecture uh, architects and, and architects. Um, there's a trend, and, and it's a it's an economic trend about making walkable cities and walkable environments because gas is only going to get more expensive, uh, and living in a walkable uh, city. There's a there's a renaissance to make walkable cities, uh-huh. and when you have a walkable city, then you have a space uh-huh. for speaking to people uh-huh. in a walkable uh-huh. cities. So if you go to like the first wave, you see this material are you know is in Vail and in triple tier suburbs in the U.S. where the architects are experimenting with walkable cities, and the first thing you see right away is that people are putting up windows. Uh-huh. So if you go to these Good. strange planned semi gated communities uh-huh. in fill in the blank triple ring suburb people okay. now walk outside because they were designed for it if they, um, could, they could bring it back yeah and, <laughs> and, and, with, and with good reason because once you make a walkable city you have all the things that you would have here in New York that you take for granted which would be like beat cops and, and a lively storefront environment where people protect uh-huh. their stores yeah. and people protect their homes uh-huh. and they reinvest in their homes yeah it can only get better it's good <laughs>